<laughs> okay. Yeah. Shana, we have a meeting. Are you, are you, cold? Are you cold, Shana? Welcome to the Standing Committee on Finance for Monday, May 16th. Madam Clerk, will you uh, read item number one, please? Order that the city petitions the general court for approval under the clause one of section eight of article two as amended of the amendments to the constitution <coughs> of the commonwealth of massachusetts an act re relative to the appointment of special police officers in the city of brockton invited honorable mayor bill carpenter john Crowley, police chief kate federoff assistant city solicitor william haley president of brockton police Pro patrolman association and lieutenant william barry detail officer mr chairman, uh, thank you if i if i might mr chairman because i I filed this to be heard uh, this evening, and I also um, met with uh, uh, Officer Healy in regards to this particular item as well. And the union supports this um, particular um, situation, and I think it's important that we, we listen to them and as well as the chief's going to um, also speak briefly, because I think when you hear what they have to say, I think at some point we here in the city is losing out a little bit and some, some revenues that we could um, see be used in different ways so that the revenues are coming into the city of Brockton instead of going out. So that's why I filed it, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll have full support and uh, be able to move forward uh, with this. So with that being said, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know Chief Crowley is here to, to kick off. So thank you, Chief. Thank you. Yes. Chief, thank you. And if you could explain what's in this act. Uh, good evening. This is um, an act relative to letting retired officers in good standing um, up to the age of 65 work um, private paid details on their, as to their retired. Um, <clears throat> the union is far it. They approach me, <clears throat> excuse me, under certain stipulations. I don't oppose it. And um, Kate Federoff is here to speak on the law portion. And I think uh, Lieutenant Bill Barry is here to speak on the detail portion. Um, and Officer Healy's here to speak for the union. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if, if I might. Councilor well, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to um, first, before we, we get to uh, um, our city attorney, and I appreciate her being here this evening as well, I'd like to have Lieutenant uh, William Barry come up because I think that's most important if we start there first and, and then we can uh, take it from that point. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, as well. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. If you could give us an explanation of uh, how the details may be working now and why we could use these, use this act. Well, the, the detail office uh, takes orders for probably um, between 85 and 10,000 jobs a year. At this time, um, and it seems to be an average, the last couple of years we were only able to fill around uh, Four to five thousand of these jobs, and we're putting anywhere from, you know, four, three, four, five thousand uh, jobs a year out to surrounding towns of Plymouth County. Um, that's the ten percent that the city gets from the uh, the work. They're not getting that. I do basically. I do the work to sub it out, and we're incurring no funds. Everything I do is really for nothing over there when it comes to the outside details to different towns in the county. Thank you. Councilor Farwell. Uh, just picking up on what Lieutenant Barry said to the rest of my, the rest of my fellow councilors, I did a little research on this myself. I've spoken to some people. This is a very good move. This is a good move because we're going to have people who came through the Brockton Police Department out doing details. They will not be able to work past the age of 65. They will have to have training. They will have to pass a physical. They're going to know the rules and regulations of the police department. To the extent that we have detours and, and other construction in the city, someone stops and asks for directions. They know our city. Now we do have people who come in, and I don't know how often it is the lieutenant can answer, but we have people coming in from other agencies. We appreciate the help, but we don't have control mm -hmm. over their training. Frankly, some of them do look like they might be a little bit over 65. I'm not quite sure how that works. <laughs> but uh, this, this brings in-house the whole issue of public safety and traffic details. And since we collect 10% of the amount of money that's billed, we're going to get 10% of the amount of money that's paid to these officers. So I hope the counselors will look favorably on this. I think it is a positive step forward. 
Um, I commend everyone who has worked on it. If it's been vetted by the law department, I, I can't imagine why this would not be something that would be very beneficial to the city. So, uh, Lieutenant, my only question to you is, we, we do have some people that come in from other towns that perhaps skate or skirt that age limitation, don't we, honestly? I'm unable to check their IDs, and I actually take what I can get because it's hard to get people on the jobs, and if I don't have people on the jobs, I get a lot of phone calls. So it gets worse. You people get phone calls. I get phone calls. We're always trying to patch things up as we go along. So to get people that are local cops, police officers that have been here for 30 years that know why we're doing things for certain reasons, we don't have to you know, re-educate the uh, outsiders. I, I just close by commending Councilor Ian Erie and others for working on this. I, th I think it's very beneficial for the city. Thank you. You know, that, Councilor? Councilor Barnes. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant, I just have a few questions. Uh, and actually, I don't know if the chief could uh, answer this too, but when you were up here early, you mentioned um, a retired officer in good standing. What, what exactly does that mean? Is there like a metrics for that? or some, like how, how was that um, evaluated in good standing? Or Can Attorney I? Federoff. So I think what the chief was referring to is that we're taking police officers who have retired through superannuation, so a normal retirement, not a disability a t retirement. Someone's been injured on duty and is forced to retire because of whatever sort of inju injury they sustain in the line of duty. So it's a veteran officer who's retired due to age and years of service as opposed to someone who's left for other reasons. And still wants to work and is able and, and will be trained and qualified and all those things. Exactly, because the so. reality is you have to be, once you're appointed as a special police officer, you have all the duties of a, a, re, a police officer like Lieutenant Barry. Okay. So in the event an emergency arises, you can respond just as easily as another police officer could. Okay, and um, so thank you very much. And so will this also include or will the civilian um, personnel at the police station, will they also be included in this or, or are they eligible? For instance, like the, um, the dispatchers and the civilians that work. So they're not permitted to do details now, civilian okay. employees currently. So retired civilian employees wouldn't qualify, no, because okay. they don't have police powers as a f civilian employee. Okay, and this kind of... Um, eliminates, I guess, Brockton's exposure to that whole issue a few years ago. And I could be wrong. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. But um, a lot of cities and towns, they were getting a lot of flack for having um, I, I, civilians, I guess, out in the street doing the details and not really knowing what to do. So this, this will help us not to kind of get involved in, in that. Do you remember that? Is, is that familiar to anybody? I'm not sure if you're referring to the fact that the state has moved to civilian flaggers. No, it, it was, um, I sure. thought it was detail work, but I, I, I could be wrong, but okay. Okay, yeah, no, but civilians will not be doing this. They'll be equipped to deal with any kind of circumstance that a normal, currently employed police officer would be dealing with. Okay, great. This is great. Thank you, uh, Councilor Neary, for, for this. This is really good. Oh, oh. Oh. Really? Really, Councilor Moynihan? You of all people. <laughs> it was a good tune. You all sat, Councilor Burns? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lieutenant Barry. I just had a quick question. Martin. How come it's hard to get people lo to do the details? They were working their well, I think the, the uh, misconception is that the details are easy work, and it's not that way. Um, <clears throat> it's stressful. They're boring. They're long. Um, it's tedious, time-consuming of your day. And, you know, police officers work a lot of hours as it is, so they don't want to keep on working more and more. You can only milk the cow so long. They're tired. The guys can't perform, so they stop. Okay, thank you. What's that, Council? Council yes. Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good Sorry. evening, uh, Lieutenant uh, Barry. A uh, quick question. Is the, um, the residency uh, requirement going to be required by these p uh, police officers? Will that apply to them or not? Maybe uh, Attorney Federoff can answer. So we specifically, oops, I'm sorry. We've specifically exempted them from, there's a general law which requires police officers to stay within a radius of so many miles. We have exempted them from that requirement because it could be that you're doing one detail in the city a year or two details in the city a year and you've already moved 
to the Cape, say, or Marshfield or something like that, so you're outside of the city limits. But bear in mind that most of these officers may have been subject to the residency requirement had they been employed at the time when it went into effect anyway, so they've already done their time with the city. As you know, the union employees don't have to stay in the city for longer than seven years as it is, so no, they're exempted from that. Okay, thank you, and the other question actually is, um, is there any sort of training for detail office? I know you mentioned that do we is there a like I don't know quick workshop or something that they do for certain requirements that's that are required by detail offices is there guidelines? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what exactly it would be called, but is there something specific that um, You know some things are just some rules that detail offices have to follow well, the, the police officers that, that you'd be getting on this are officers that have already gone through the police academy. The, the basic curriculum supports all that training. And then their 20, 30, 40, or how many years they put in of experience here is, the, is their education in that area. As far as the detail system, we have our rules that, you know, what you need to wear, what you need to have with you to perform the, the task. But... It's all covered as your career goes on. Okay. okay. And in addition, sorry, <laughs> Lieutenant Barry, I'm jumping in. But in addition to, um, if you look at, I think it's section six, there's additional training for those who may have been off the force for, for a little while and they need a refresher. They're also required to um, abide by our existing policies, procedures, and regulations. And will they be in uh, Brockton police uniforms or will, it, will they be like, so different dress code or will, will they have the same uniform? So detail officers wear something different than, than this dark blue suit. They wear a collared shirt with a logo on it and they'll be equipped with a firearm and they'll be wearing that same kind of collared shirt but it's not these dress blues. But they will be identifiable as the Brock, that they're brought to details. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do apologize. I was a couple minutes tardy. I was at my son's t-ball game, and of course that yeah. trumps finance committee, Mr. Chairman. Um, with that being said, if, if I could, um, Attorney Federoff, I just had a couple questions um, relative to this. I, I know other neighboring, first of all, good evening, um, other neighboring communities um, actually uh, got rid of this concept due to the fact that the liability um, once you enact it, I mean, you own those people for the good or for bad. So I guess I guess my thought would be relative to the liability exposure, number one. Number two, um, if these employees uh, are acting in capacity on behalf of the city of Brockton, um, then are they going to be deemed as additional insureds because we self-insure? we self -insure? Um, So that, that's, that's my first question to you on that. So the reality is, yes, we own them if they're injured, just as we do a Brockton police officer, um, if we had a case where someone just leaned down to pick up some, something goofy, I don't know, with some sort of tool for one of the workers, injured himself, and we own him, um, these, these folks we would own as well. But bear in mind that they're people who have retired superannuation, so they don't have a pre-existing condition which would make them a greater risk than anyone we have now. So, but yes, we would own them if they went out IOD. Okay. To the extent that, you know, IOD is calculated based on the amount of money you've earned. Right, right. But I know like, like the, the town of Randolph got rid of this concept based strictly on a financial endeavor. Um, in terms of, um, and maybe this was stated, if it was, I apologize, but what, what, what's the union's position on this? They're both, both unions, both the supervisors and patrolmen are both fully supportive. Fully supportive. And in terms of um, if this is enacted and we start to utilize this as a city, will that in essence phase out the need to use Plymouth County Sheriff uh, for details and or reaching out to other local municipalities? It's intended to reduce our reaching out to other municipalities. I'm not sure about Plymouth County Sheriff, so I would leave that to Lieutenant Barry because I think that the Sheriff Department does state work. So the state roads, is that correct? They do everything. Oh, they do everything. So it would be the same extent that the other communities, if we're reaching out to Bridgewater now, we would hope to reach out to them less in the in 
with the expectation that we would get that 10% administrative fee, which would otherwise be lost to us. Okay, and, and I guess I have just two more quick questions relative to um, the, the municipal age requirement of retirement of 65. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, that's gonna, that's gonna adhere you're not going to reach out to people over that age. Yeah, and I'll tell you, so I think it may have been Boston that recently just went through the legislature. They raised the age to 67, and we had long discussions with the union over that issue. But it was my feeling if you're giving these folks the same police powers that you that Brockton police enjoy, um, and they're capped out at 65, I felt you should cap these guys out at 65 as well because the idea is they could jump in and assist at any given moment um, in and around the detail. If there's an armed robbery right in front of them, they can react. And the, the 65 uh, cap was enacted mm -hmm. to ensure that you're physically able to do so. So I felt it was important to keep it that way. Okay. And my last question would be if, if, these, if this is enacted and these people become um, really special employees for the city of Brockton under the auspices of the, of the police department, would, would those individuals have the ability, because they wouldn't be, they'd be non-union employees, correct? Non-union, yes. So would they, would they be able to go to the state um, civil service commission for grievances or if they feel that they were, could, could they use that as an avenue? They're specifically in this legislation exempted from both collecting collective bargaining agreement, civil service, unemployment, and, oh, and the residency. But they could go to MCAD if they felt they like could, they were discriminated. Yes, that's they true. They, they could go to MCAD if we had a discriminant, if we engaged in discriminatory conduct, they, like anyone else, could, could go to could MCAD. Could use that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Monaghan. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Sullivan asked most of my questions. <coughs> I don't think so. Oh, you did. You, you stole them again. Uh, <laughs> hey, Stud, how old are you now? It's Councilor Studensky. <laughs> I mean, sorry, Councilor Studensky? <laughs> no, I, just seriously, are these other towns now that come work for us, if we're going to cap it at 65, are they going to be capped at 65 before they can come? I mean, they can't work here if they're over 65 either, who are going to? Because personally, I think 67... You could probably still uh, assist and jump in there and give the guy a couple more years to be able to do that. Cutting to 65, if we're going to allow outsiders to come in and work, if they're older 65, I don't know if that's fair to, to our guys. So would, there, would that be part of the deal that if you're over 65, you can't work in the city on a detail? No, I wouldn't say that because right now this, the this, the surrounding towns that we utilize, those offices are all under 65, so we don't get the, the way we run into trouble is when we go reaching out to the uh, surrounding towns and they're sending us one of their specials that maybe is 67 or 68 years old. And as I said, I don't ask them how old they are when they come because I really need the work. Workers. Oh yeah, no, I know. I just was wondering because I, I hate to just cab it at 65 if we let other people come in at 67 or something like that, and they're probably still. I'd say they're probably still able to do their job. So I think the distinction is too, and it goes to the IOD point, um, we own our specials if they get injured on the job. So there's a risk if you're doing, especially, okay, nine times at, no, probably 99% of the time, you're not gonna run into an armed rob robber. But should that case arise, we own them. So it's, it, it's more likely that an injury could occur, and that's why there was the statutory cap on police officers generally of 65. Right, right. So that's why I felt like it was important, whereas we're not owning the other people. All right, okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Stanetsky. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lieutenant Barry, now this is gonna make it a safe environment out there. There'll be issued uh, radios, be able to contact if. Yes. They'll have the weapons, same weapons as our people. They'll basically be identical to what I'm doing right now, <coughs> other than a uniform that the people... Remain trained. Right, correct. And the union will have, have nothing, no problem, as long as all their people are asked to fill a position before you go to this other list. Am I correct? Correct. Right. Well, I'm in full support, and I know for a fact that way back before the year 2000, 
a fellow that uh, Mayor Farwell uh, made an appointment of, had the idea to start this, and he tried to get it done and couldn't. But this is an important thing, and it's important for our citizens because there's nothing worse than a relative of a citizen coming in and saying, hey, how do I get to Court Street? And the person says, you have to get out of the fourth cop on the right because I don't work in the city. I don't know where Court Street is. That's what happens. Right. My full support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor, well, well, Councilor Rodriguez, no, you haven't spoken. Councilor Rodriguez. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant Berry, how are you? Good, how are you? I just have a quick question, and I'm not exactly sure if it was asked, and I do apologize for being a little um, tardy. Traffic, unreal, coming back from Boston. Um, how many officers do you seriously see applying for uh, this particular detail position? As they retire? Um, I'm I saying how big do you see this pool of officers realistically because if once we approve this you have to have a pool of um, officers that you can kind of tap into right to do road details and other details in the community well every year the pool should grow initially um, I don't know how many people are retiring in 2016 I don't know how many people retired within the last few years but if there's a class of 15 and they got hired 32 years ago, and there's 10 of them left, there's 10. The next year, if there's a class of 12 that, re that was hired 31 years ago, and they're retiring, we ha now we have 15 to 20. And the pool will grow as the years go on. The first year, we might not have five people, but after that, the pool is just gonna grow, it will grow. But see, that leads me to my next question, because for instance, if you're a neighboring community, and you know that Brockton is now utilizing its own retirees to mm -hmm. basically do road detail. Um, how do you assure that we have enough um, officers available to do details if we move into a situation where we require a lot more than the five that you have available? Well, we're not going to eliminate. If you're a community that you know that you're no longer coming to Brockton because Brockton went away from doing this, how hard is it going to be to kind of convince, let's say, the Bridgewaters of the world or some of these other communities that we use their officers to come back into Brockton yeah, in a pinch or some things like that? I don't really Funny. think we'll feel any of that. Uh, the work is kind of cyclical. It goes around. So we're, we're always tapping different places. I can call Avon. They have nobody today. Uh, Holbrook would send us eight guys. Next week, Avon has six guys and Holbrook has none. It's just you have to reach out to everybody and we wouldn't have we wouldn't be displacing them so much that they would say i'm not going over there because as long as you're calling them and asking them to come over inviting them they're still going to be there for you is, is that where you're going well well kind of but let's just say you've been using avon let's use them for as an example for the last six months or so now there are officers who are relying on this little side uh job in the sense to uh for their own benefits are no longer going to be utilized because we got a new pool of um, officers that we can tap. Aren't you worried that there's going to be some ill feelings or so from the no, Avon not, side of not things at all, knowing that they're no longer? Th those communities already have their special police officers too. They understand they're not going to, they don't, there's no grudges that anybody's going to hold and say, oh, we're not going to Brockton because they have specials. Um, if I was to insult them by hiring them and then canceling them every day at 7 a.m., they might say, I'm not going over there anymore. But that's not the case. There's, plenty, there's, plenty, there's more than enough work to keep our guys and our community outreach going. Nick. And just to be clear, it's our Brockton police officers, both patrolmen and supervisor, supervisors who are always utilized first so it's only when there's a gap do we go to other communities and here we're first going to fill the gap with the retired police and school police and then reach out to the other communities after that so there's still going to be opportunity but first and foremost otherwise the patrolman would not be on board with this they get the first it's their bargained unit work so we would be in big trouble if we went reach to the other communities first. So you first have to exhaust the 200 people we have on the force now before you even go out to the outside. But Kate, my concern was the other way around. You not having enough, enough from your own pool 
to fill the jobs that you have in the community because right. as council a point forward, of information i think you were late the problem this came up is because at presently he is unable to fill about how many per year about how many details per year are you not filling anywhere from two to four thousand so currently there's about two to four thousand opportunities for this that he's unable to fill and that's part that's the biggest reason councilor ranieri file this at their behest so that came up right at the beginning of the meeting just so that actually should help the the four the four thousand two to four thousand requests that you have and yet not create some sort of an ill feeling with the other communities that's basically the i, I don't believe there'll be any animosity between the the uh surrounding towns that we're using now and our department okay all right thank you thank you mr chum thank you uh council you all said council farewell uh councilor barnes i just have one more i'm sorry um just as you were talking i started thinking I'm go ahead no nope. did you say barnes? barnes oh okay i'm sorry <laughs> i lost time um so these officers are pretty much officers they, and you know if something were to happen in the street they would go out and respond as an officer and not to diminish their you know their character uh, their category but would they also possibly be used to maybe fill um a day uh, like a shift so for instance if uh, you have several people that called out sick and then you're you're low for people to come in or, or to take up um, an actual <coughs> shift day overnight or whatever would these special officers also be eligible or be called in to do an actual road shift or patrol shift no not at this time okay so where does it say that they can't because i was trying to read through to try to look specifically and i mean it, it does kind of say detail like that's all we're kind of focusing on is that these you know guys and gals will be doing detail but what's to prevent you know in a in a crunch that you don't have enough to patrol a you know midnight to eight or whatever that these folks might get called in and and then what is our liability for that it just doesn't say it in here I, that's why i was I don't want to address the liability issue, but I, I would just say that the police officers union and the supervisors union have agreed to this for retired guys to work details, road details. Right. I, I think I'm just trying to project like going forward um, and kind of what yeah, Councilor Rodriguez said, like our pool. I think I might be able to just explain it. If, okay. if they have retired, right. they can't, a shift would be, would be compensated in overtime. If they're retired officers, they can't be paid overtime because they're already subject to retirement. Okay. So these are only private vendor details. Only, pri okay, private vendor detail. Okay, um, should that say that or? I mean, I, I know this council has been very, you know, has been a stickler before about specifically listing exactly what someone's, um, does it? Uh, private does it say that in here so I think what you're going to look at is section one and it says to perform police details or duties arising therefrom whereas a, a, a regular shift would not encompass that so although we haven't expressly carved it out it's not expressly permitted and this legislation is is an act by us by the city of Brockton to empower people who otherwise wouldn't be permitted to do. So you permit them to do a small set of things, and that's right there. It's like the third line in, to perform police details or any any duties arising therefrom. Right, I, I understand that, but I'm just saying- It's not There are other things that, you know, I, like I said, this council particularly has been stickler on making sure that it is spelled out so that there's no ambiguity going forward. Yeah. Um, because if you get someone really shrewd, you know, they could kind of- get into this but I'm um, okay so in my mind there is no ambiguity because they're only empowered <coughs> to do this small piece of work as opposed to the whole gambit of a Brockton police officer or a special police officer okay and actually I'm sorry one more actually I'm not sorry but just one more question yeah. so say for instance this special police officer comes across a armed robbery mm -hmm. they go into action and you know they do the whole thing and now they have powers of arrest do they go forward in the station, go through booking, go through court, go, I mean, do they do all of that? And how would that be compensated if that were the case? So they're just compensated as part of their detail. They don't get extra compensation for doing any particular act, just as a regular police officer doesn't get a, 
a bonus or something for the number of rest during a shift. Right, it's but that's, that would be the, under... I'm the sorry. duties arising therefrom. Right, but that would be under the official sworn in police officer duty, so they wouldn't be eligible for any kind of overtime or any kind of additional things. But this special officer thrown into, which I hope will be, you know, a, a very uncommon thing, um, how, how would we deal with that, too, as a, you know, un, under this? The way that would happen, uh, what would happen was, uh, the police officer working the detail that activated himself in the armed robbery right. that you're talking about, right. any action he took would then be transferred uh, over to a, a, a police officer working the shift that A sworn day. officer? He, he would say, this is what I saw, this is what I did, and I arrested him. The officer would take that man to, to, the, to the jail, book him, do okay. all the processing, the paperwork, the arrest report. Okay. Uh, this detail officer would just give a statement, basically, as to what he did. Would then become a witness, pretty much. Become a witness, yes. And he'd go to court for $6, witness fee, like every other person. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. I, th I think I'm, I'm done now. Thank you so much Thank for you. indulging me. Councilor Rainier, do you want to finish? Uh, we I do one unless, other. unless there's someone else who wants to speak. Uh, I just had one quick follow-up, if I could. Uh, well, Councilor Firewall did first. Uh, I just wanted to clarify my colleague, uh, Councillor Barnes, concern. If you look at Section 3 of this proposed act, it reads, Special police officers shall, when performing the duties under Section 1, have the same power to make arrests and perform other police functions as do regular police officers of the City of Brockton. And Section 1 limits them to just the police details. So Section 3 actually says, yeah, you have police powers. Yes, you can function as a police officer, but you can only do it on a, while you're assigned to a special detail. Now, if you're on a special detail and you see an armed robbery or something happens, naturally that becomes an extension of your detail work, but you wouldn't be able to come in and fill a shift. Uh, you wouldn't be able to, for example, uh, uh, well, perform any of the duties that the regular police officers would because you're limited to Section 1 and, and having police powers to do that. Now, I'm, again, I'm not an attorney, and I would defer to Attorney Fedorov, but it, it seems, this seems pretty well written, and it kind of locks everybody into where they should be so that there's very little wiggle room, particularly where you exempt them from collective bargaining and, and uh, all of the other benefits to which you'd ordinarily be entitled. But, but I do hear where you're coming from. I hope that makes my colleague feel a little better. Thank you. Councillor Sullivan. Last quick question, if I could, uh, Attorney Fedorov. Um, just in terms of the liability again, and, and I concur with Mr. Stadensky, uh, Councillor Stadensky, I, I mean, I support this. I think it's going to be a really good thing. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the liability where we would own these people, it's much like we'd own any of our employees. But what, what dawned on me is, has there been anybody injured outside of the confines, meaning from Avon or Holbrook or Plymouth County that has brought an action against Brockton on a detail? No, and they, so they would be Avon police officers, so their IOD would be covered through that. So it'd be city. a subrogation between it, or is it just, yeah. the, okay, okay. All right, that's good news. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Ranieri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank uh, everyone that's here this evening that's spoken on behalf of uh, this particular order. And, of course, I want to uh, thank my colleagues, too, for bringing up some, some good points of interest and, and for vetting the situation out um, to what we're trying to do here this evening, which I think, as uh, some of our councils have said, is in the best interest of the city, best interest of public safety. And I definitely concur with um, listening for opinions coming from uh, uh, Councillor Fowell, uh, who served as a patrolman for many years, and of course, uh, our, our esteemed uh, colleague from Ward 4, who not only served as patrolman, but was uh, chief of police for uh, I don't know how many years. Um, still looks good, though, at his age. But uh, in any Thanks case, very much done. in any case, I think listening to them and also what other concerns colleagues had, um, I think um, we're, we're well overdue with this. Um, I think we, we need to be doing something. It, we need to be able to bring in some other revenues into the city, and that's where we're losing out right now by not having this in, in place. So with that being said, I'm, I'm going to move for a favorable recommendation Second. back to the full Second. city council. Yeah. Yeah. Motion made and seconded about three times to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, item number two. Order that in accordance with the Mass General Law Chapter 44, the City Council authorizes the acceptance in expenditure of the total grant award in the amount of 
from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Urban Agenda Program to the City of Brockton Planning Department Urban Agenda Program Grant Fund to conduct feasibility studies and develop a business plan for the projects, a restaurant incubator, a community kitchen food incubator, and a co-work space, no match required. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Connor, Financial Officer, Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Councilors, just before we move on this, uh, I did receive uh, communication from both the mayor, who was uh, in town but uh, tied up tonight, and Mr. May, who was out of town at a conference. He did say that if uh, Mr. Condon couldn't answer your questions that he would be we can postpone this and he would be happy to take any questions at, uh, at the next finance meeting in the meantime council Monaghan, you file this i believe correct yes i did if you, would you, could you um go over this for us Ms. Condon, please? Well, it's pretty simple it's a fifty thousand uh, dollar grant from the state with no match requirement and the purpose of the grant is to provide feasibility study for that restaurant incubator uh and a um, associated uh food incubator workspace common workspace and having established the feasibility study then to develop business plans for it. monies from the state and I think we went over this when we were going out the plan for downtown anyway so it's just an addition to help yes. boost that so and, okay thank you I don't know if anybody said no, well well part of me wanted to table this only because I wondered if the feasibility study was going to involve some marketing and suggested locations I didn't know how comprehensive that was going to be and I can't expect mr. Condon to answer that but I'll, I'll wait and see if my other counselors have questions or if, or if I, I think the proceed. location is Frederick Douglass way. Uh, that's my understanding right. of it. And I, mm -hmm. and I think it would involve marketing, but I can't get much more in detail than that counselor. Any other questions? No. Motion for favorable recommendation. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, counselors. Thank you. Item number three. Resolved that the Executive Director of Brockton Interfaith Community and Angel Cause may be invited to appear before a committee of the Council to report on their findings on the faith-based concerns addressing the root causes of shootings and other violence in our community. Invited Lou Finfer, Executive Director of MCAN, Isabel Lopez, Lead Organizer Bick, and Angel Cause may Associate Community Organizer Bick. Council right Beauregard. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I file this resolve, and uh, I've invited up here this evening and asked uh, both Angel uh, Cosmo, the um, new um, organizer for Broughton Faith Community, and the director, Isabel Lopez, uh, to I explain what their findings were when they interviewed over 350 individuals in the city for um, from November of uh, last year 2015 to April of 2016 and I believe they have handouts that are coming out right now so I guess I'll let them begin by doing their presentation thank, thank you. you thank you good evening everyone go ahead so just so you know, everyone know, um, I'm Isabel, and we actually, uh, it's not Lou Finfer, but it's uh, the president of BIC uh, who's here with us, um, Stanley J. Noel. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Angel Cosme. I'm uh, Brockton Interfaith's uh, associate organizer. Prior to becoming a community organizer with BIC, I was teaching um, in, in uh, several school districts for the last several years. So I, I want to talk today about two reports that um, everyone should have. Uh, they're, they're two separate reports. One is based on community listening sessions that we've done uh, with congregations and the community uh, for several months where we interviewed uh, hundreds of people around the issue of violence and the shootings that occur here in Brockton. The other report is a youth-based report on the relationship between the police department and young people. Uh, and some findings on that. So I just want to briefly highlight some of the uh, summary uh, on both of these reports. The first report uh, entitled the one on the uh, shootings and the violence, basically out of that we found five themes um, that the people and the congregations were concerned with uh, as far as root causes. One was the issue of substance abuse. The other one had to do with homelessness. Uh, the third one had to do with programs for youth, the perception that there may not be enough programs or knowledge or eligibility criteria for programs, et cetera. Uh, education, and the last one was the police interactions with the community. 
Um, so just to back up a little bit, in terms of our community organizing model, these are not findings that we came up with or that we try to uh, you know, uh, influence in any way. The first thing that we do in, in community organizing is we conduct listening sessions, where we actually go and we listen to the congregations and the community about their concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I, I just want to emphasize that that's what we did first. Um, other aspects of the community organizing model is for us to conduct some research based on the findings of, of the community and then after to take action. So what I'm doing now is, is giving you the information that we got from the community in <coughs> hopes of in the future establishing some sort of partnership. What do we do with this information? We know that there's violence, we know that there's shootings. How do we solve this issue collectively? And so that's why I'm, I'm up here today. Um, so in terms of the youth report, I just want to highlight some of the, the, the findings. Again, this, this was local congregations, Brockton High participants, Champion High School. Uh, we even had students from Massasoit College, the Mayor's Youth Council. Um, we also polled some students from the Mayor's uh, Youth Summit. So in total, we had about <coughs> 80, close to 100 uh, surveys, and some of them are still coming in. Um, and again, it was conducted from August of last year to April of this year. <coughs> Uh, ages ranged from 14 to 25. There was probably two people in the 20s. Most of them were under the age of 18. And if I could just uh, highlight some of the cultural backgrounds of the youth, you know, it was very diverse. Uh, we had students from Nigeria, Peru, African Americans, Caucasians, Vietnamese, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Malaysian, Cape Verdean. And while the students were diverse, the findings were not so diverse. Um, there was an overwhelming theme of indifference, distrust, and a feeling of disconnect uh, between the police department and the youth. I wanna say up front, before I get into some of the stories of the youth, that not everything was negative, and, and it is not my intention to portray uh, the Brockton Police Department as um, you know, intentionally committing acts that, are, that you'll hear about. Uh, the, the youth were, specific in mentioning the good that comes out of Brockton Police. So I want to be fair and mention that, and I, I mentioned that in the report as well. But whether or not it's perception or reality, these, these are real experiences for young people, and, and they should be heard. Um, so one quote um, was asked, uh, you know, do, do you trust the police? And, and the youth said, to put my trust and safety into a man who wears a badge would be welcoming my demise. Um, another youth stated that they did not trust the police because they said, I'm scared they'll shoot me for no reason. Again, whether it's perception from the individual or reality, it still warrants some, some kind of uh, analysis. They also, another common theme was that the police are sort of rougher um, with communities of color and that they treat communities of color poorer, that they have little to no tolerance in certain occasions and that they're specifically targeted because of their race and their dress. The, the cultural dress sort of, um, you know, in, in their opinion, targets. So racism, discrimination, profiling was also noted uh, in this report. And then the, the third uh, point that I would make is that there was perceptions or realities of abuse of power. Um, youth felt that police could have handled the situation differently if they listened. Instead of reacting, they felt that some police officers used bravado and rudeness, um, went overboard, used excessive force, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the, the stories, I just want to share a couple of stories um, that the youth said. You know, one youth said that the, the, her best friend's dad was shot and killed by the police. There was another story about this sex offender that was run, walking around. The person called, the youth called the police and it wasn't warranted uh, any, any kind of attention, so that person felt really unsafe. Um, one gentleman said the first day of getting his driver's license, he was pulled over and had a gun put to the back of his head. They searched his car and found nothing. This man indicated that the police raided the wrong house and, and clubbed his grandmother um, a, as a result of, of some kind of indication. Uh, another one said that they're extremely rude and that every interaction with cops they have something negative. Um, one, one other youth said growing his hatred because of a situation grew five times more, um, and, and on and on. I mean, there's stories like this. But to be fair, uh, other, other youth indicated that police were quick to respond to their calls, that they were helpful in, in stopping drug trafficking and crime in their neighborhood. 
um, that they did not treat students of color uh, unequally, that they were fair, um, that they did protect residents, that they were fast to respond, and that there was trust between the community and, and the police. So I, I want to be sure to mention that. Um, in, in sort of concluding this, I just want to read the last uh, piece of the youth report. And it says that Brockton Interfaith uh, plans to distribute this report and present it to the elected officials of Brockton, which is why we're here. Uh, this report will also be shared with the Brockton Police Department in hopes of establishing a meeting. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to help create a climate between the Brockton Police Department and Brockton citizens that fosters trust and security and that will ultimately assist with the redirection of, of the city of Brockton. It is important for us to know that not all police officers are treating young people and residents of Brockton in unjust ways and that there are multiple viewpoints to every story. With that said, we must also be cautious in neglecting the real experiences noted in these reports and that we must honor those stories in order to work to find solutions wherever warranted. Um, so we have this information and uh, the sort of the, the next thing that we're, we're, we've done and um, Councilor Lally was present during the, the time that we released these reports to the public during uh, a citywide, a big citywide a couple of weeks ago. We shared this report with, with the community and, and the congregations and everyone else who was invited. And um, we have since uh, conducted a couple of follow-up meetings with the community. And what we're trying to do is, is create LOCs, local organizing committees, around the issues that surfaced from this. So we're in the sort of the building stages of that. Um, where concerned citizens are meeting on a regular basis with the support of BIC and other organizations to address these issues. And it is our hope, again, that in the future we can collaborate to, to find some solutions. So I just wanted to make everyone aware that we've polled hundreds of people. These are some of the findings, and we're looking for some collaboration and some collective solutions to, to this issue. So I don't know if Mike, Isabel wants to add anything. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Isabel Lopez. I'm the lead organizer at Brockton Interfaith. And I promise we will never host, hold uh, a citywide or a meeting without, you know, being on a Mondays. I mean, being on Mondays. So we're going to have to change it because we understand that everyone is here on, me on meetings on Mondays. So I heard from a couple of our counselors that it was not the best day. So, um, and I also heard. Uh, from a couple of you too, um, the last time where we did a citywide. So, um, you know, I apologize for having this on a, sun, on a Monday. Uh, the majority of board members, though, are available on Mondays. That's why we do it. We do the meetings on Mondays, but I'm going to go back to them and let them know. Um, so, um, just, you know, um, a little bit, um, you know, uh, following up from what Angel was saying, um, you know, we all understand that. The budget cuts are affecting Brockton and that Brockton is suffering a lot of budget cuts for jobs for youth, resources for youth, and issues with the education system. For example, the disciplinary um, uh, the merit system that Brockton High has. So we have heard a lot, of, a lot about that. And we really would like to, um, to work together how we can address these issues because as you know, BIC was ex exist since 1990s to address the root causes of a lot of the issues that afflict Brockton. So we are here as partners and we look forward to collaborate. Um, you know, if um, Stanley, do you wanna? Um, so um, if you have any questions, I would like to, uh, to for Stanley to say something about uh, this report and how, you know, he's a, uh, a Brockton, <coughs> yes, Brockton member. Yeah. Hi, everybody. How you guys doing? Um, if you guys have any questions, um, I'm glad to uh, try to answer them. So I'll let you guys have the floor at this moment. Uh, I'll take that, take over that. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, actually, and just there's some overlap with your reports, but uh, the, what the order is tonight is about the root causes of shootings and other violence in our community. So I realize there's some overlap, but that's really what we're supposed to be talking about tonight. Uh, Councilor Lally, I believe you had some questions? Yes, I did. Uh, thank you for coming here tonight. Um, I just had a quick question, really on, on some, of the, some of the quotes you'd, you'd mentioned. Um, I, I recently got back from a, a trip to Chicago, and the line 
through the security checks was three hours long. And so they pulled some people ahead because their flight had been held for 40 minutes. So they pulled a group of people out ahead of line and a man was, uh, was very, very upset with the TSA agents about it. And he, was, he took it sort of as a, as a personal slight. And that, I started thinking about that as really a, a, something of, of perception. Some of these, these words used, you can really tell it's kind of teenage kind of words because they, 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 they're very mel melodramatic in some, in some cases. How much of this would you say really is perception? Because I, I have not heard any, any uh, I, in, in my discussions with people, I haven't, I haven't heard anyone really have anything bad to say about our police department like this. Okay. Um, I, I would say that every single story in here, the quotes, um, w it, it's hard to put a percentage on, on what I think it's perception, but if you ask that individual if it's reality, I think they're gonna tell you yes. Um, whether or not, I, I think hearing this, it, it makes us all uncomfortable, it makes me uncomfortable, because I know that there's a majority of police officers risking their life to keep us safe. I understand that, I respect that. Um, it is not them that we're referring to. But absolutely, without a doubt, I can also stand here and say that there are instances of abuse. Um, and, you know, for, for example, one of these situations that a, that a teen noted, his, his father was shot and killed, and, and according to this young man, you know, he sur the father surrendered, um, but because of the situation, this person felt that they hated life. That is not a, a, a perception. That is a real consequence of a situation that our, occurred our from losing his father. Our perceptions are our realities. Can become I, reality, I get absolutely. That, yes. So it, it still warrants um, a discussion because if they're feeling that or if it actually occurred, if it didn't occur, that's how they feel the police department is treating them. And there should be collaboration. I just want to also mention that last year there was a very, very successful effort. Um, thank you to uh, Officer Rosie and Ali Spears um, who put together a police in the streets basketball tournament um, on the east side and it was attended by like three, four hundred community members. There was free music. Kids won, won pairs of Jordans. They got to design their own sneakers. That's what we want. We want that kind of community in Brockton between the police and the young people. Um, so we're just, we're just advocating for the voices of the young people to be heard and for some dialogue to be created in fostering community, true community uh, between the police and the youth, young Did people. Did this young man or young woman, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, who had their father shot, what, was it in Brockton? Was it by the Brockton police? Where was it? Every, every, every uh, question has to do with Brockton police. So every police I, I officer I don't have the details of that particular case. PD. Okay. Yes. Every, every story in here is pertaining to their experiences with Brockton police. It was specific to Brockton. All right. Um, hmm. Now, some of these things really, and you know, you, you'll see this if you, if you see a couple people get in a fight or something. They both have two different, two different, uh, statements on what happened you know he started it or he started it could i i'm 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 really i'm really thinking here looking at some of this stuff it it could be you know the the teenager who had his driver's license and says you know he wasn't he wasn't doing any doing anything and he was pulled over and then there was a uh, a shocking amount of, of violence really reported was was this entirely, was, he'd just gotten his license, you know, was it, could he have been violating a rule of the road? Could he have given the police officer some reason to investigate? Quite, quite likely, right? Um, but I think this is the kind of conversation that I would love for you to have with that young man in some future. Absolutely, right? I would love to hear so we could some actually of these. hear the stories and hear the specifics. We don't have the specifics of the stories, just sort of the general themes that we yeah. found. To, to that point, there was another young man, and our young people are, are, are smart. There was one young man who said um, he was able to articulate how committing a crime led to that particular police in interaction, to him being arrested, and he was disciplined at home, and he takes full responsibility that his actions led to that kind of situation. So I'm giving you a full spectrum, but it was, it was 
overwhelming the sense of distrust between young communities of color and, and the Brockton Police Department. And that is what I want to highlight. Whether it's perception or not, it warrants that kind of discussion. And I, would, I would love to, uh, I, I, I do agree that our young people are, are kind of smart too. Yep. Um, I, would, I would certainly love to hear, you know, the, a lot of these, some of these reports, you know, speak to, speak to these people. And uh, certainly if, if there is an overwhelming feeling of, of unrest or distrust, that's something we have to bridge and get, uh, get past. I'm, I'm just, so some of the stuff is kind of, kind of, kind of surprising. It does, it does, it's, it, it really isn't the, uh, the Brockton Police Department I've, I've heard of before. And I, it, it causes me to really look at this, ta look at this with a, uh, take it with quite a few grains of salt. Councilor, with all due respect, I, I will also say um, that for all of us, if we are not part of certain communities, if our realities are detached, if our life experiences, our educational upbringing, the neighborhoods that we live in is different from a lot of these youth, then we will never know what their stories are. I, uh, I will, ne they have some, I will some never some know exactly what their struggle is, yes. I, and I, I appreciate I, your I willingness to, to have that discourse. Absolutely. We'll have to... Have to uh, meet with some of these people or see these reports. In yeah, full. and we can, say, we can say that about any situation, right? He said this. Yeah. It's not just yeah. between police and young people, right? There's yeah. two sides to every story and every situation. To, seems to be a lot of uh, ex ex excessive, I don't know, adjectives or something. It's, it seems to be really I'm emphasized. I'm, I'm not sure the right, right word, but it seems really over the, over the top. So our hope? is that we're not here coming to present and we're getting into an argument, she say, he say, or just perception. This is what the community is saying and our hope is that we will work with each one of you, that you will meet with your neighbors, with your constituents and find out these details. Mm. And so that's why we're here as a community, to bring you this information so you can go back to your constituents and ask them and come with us to this means where we're gonna have all the youth presenting this findings. Yes. And okay. then uh, thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you. Council Monaghan. I'm all set now. Thank you. Council Razak. Thank you. Good evening, Angel. Good. Um, thank you for all this information. I think information is power. Um, you said that you sent this information on to the Brockton Police Department, correct? We just, uh, we have left a couple messages for him and I just caught him on the hallway. So well, when you say are, him, is yeah. that the police yeah, chief, the chief Crowley? Yeah. Okay. Very Thank good. You. Yeah. So we are hoping to uh, meet with him soon uh, because it was not our intention to come. And, you know, our intention is to build community relationship. This is what the community wants. So our intention is we're here trusting this is space for all of us to work together. So that's our part of our next steps to meet with the chief of police. But we wanted to bring to you all since you all couldn't make it to our city <coughs> But that's why, you know. Thank you, Isabel. And that's what it's about. It's about working together. Um, and I know that, uh, Angel, you mentioned uh, the tournament last year with uh, Officer uh, Rosie. There's also a lot of programs, and you hit on a little bit of it in the beginning. The city has... The city of Brockton offers a lot to its youth. I think it's a matter of getting that information out to them and having helping the uh, youth take advantage of it. For example, a lot of people aren't familiar with the um, Brockton Police Youth Academy, which takes place, I, I know last year it was at the um, Pluff Academy, which my uh, two daughters took were part of. They take a group of uh, kids and they put them through it just what it's called, the police academy, and it teaches kids what a police officer goes through, and at the end they get a little certificate, but that's a program that I, I really, I was impressed, and um, I think it brings the youth closer to the police officers, and it makes them uh, feel comfortable because they're in the community, and it's all part of community policing, so it's a matter of just getting that information and helping um, kids, no matter what part of the city um, they live in, to kind of help them and guide them. And sometimes all it takes is just to ask them and um, show them that we care and that we want to work with them. We're not all against, I mean, we all live here together. So it's just a matter of doing what's best for the community. And, and we're finding that too, that um, over and over people are saying there's, there's not enough opportunities for young people in Brockton. 
and I started, you know, saying that, but, but I'm, I'm... Can you speak into the microphone, please? Sorry. I'm, I'm starting to change my mind about this, this con concept of not having enough opportunities for, for young people in Brockton. While that may be the case in certain situations, I, th I think Brockton, like you said, Councillor, has a lot of opportunities for young people. They may not know about it. They may not be enough spaces. They may be eligibility criteria or space limitations. But there's a lot going on, and I don't think there's no centralized place, and that's part of, part of the issue. Um, but with all that we have, there's still opportunities for, for expansion and, and analysis of what is here and what's missing. Um, so that's a conversation that we'd love to have. Very good, and whatever we, I can do on my end. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. And it's part of um, some of the next steps with the committees that were formed at the Citywide is that people will do research in a lot of these areas so uh, more collaborations can be built across the city, across programs, and across nonprofits and across agencies. So everybody can be, you know, um, putting their resources together to work for the better of the city. So that's, you know, that's what um, some of the committees are going to be doing research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try not to be too long, but I do have a lot of questions, and I'm trying to keep it to the actual report. It would be nice if we talked about what was filed. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to, but, Sorry, I mean, that wasn't really what was presented. So the only, Correct. I only have questions for what you all gave me, but I'm going to try to go back to that. Um, with that said, so these stories that you got in this other report, were they verified, or did you just take it in and then put it in the report? They're, they're antidotal. So whatever they told us is what we wrote in the report. They actually wrote themselves. Okay. So we didn't interview them. They wrote, they saw the questions and responded on a hard copy. Okay. Report. So is there, and, and I guess that goes for also the responses that uh, led to the root causes of shootings and violence. So, so th those were done by in congregations, uh, listening sessions in congregations. Uh, we did uh, public housing and we did youth uh, groups. Okay. Uh, at different congregations. So now going forward, and I mean, you, you, you just said that you're, you're going to share this, um, you know, with the community at large and yeah, we did um, the, oh, oh, that's right, at the meeting, yeah. that's right, sorry, um, I yeah. wasn't able to go. At the um, city But, you know, with the police, is there a way to, um, and I, I don't, is, is there a way to maybe just, um, so that there's not so much or, or there's not so uh, an open door for doubt in some of these stories because like uh, uh, Council Lally said you know he's like this isn't the Brockton police that I've ever heard of but I have heard some of the stories uh, you know I and I mean I come from a very different perspective and you all mentioned that as well and even uh, even though I'm of color I'm African-American one of these identified people uh, um, here that you all looked at for the kids um, I'm a female so I also have a very different experience with all law enforcement than what a young black male um, so is, is there a way to maybe kind of, um, I, I don't know, I, I guess vet some of the, the responses so that, first of all, again, like I said, they're not doubted because some of these, some of these accusations in here are very, very concerning. And I'd not, I'd not heard of some of these, but they're, very, they're, they're of great concern to me. Um, so it, it, is that something you guys are looking in, into doing? Into actually, um, so what we want to do when we meet with, with uh, the chief of, of police um, and, you know, hopefully the city council is bring the stories, the actual individuals who are most affected so they can tell you firsthand what their experiences are. Um, do we go back and, 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 and check whether or not this happened? No, I don't, I don't think any kind of community poll does that where they actually they take people's word for it. And, yeah, you have to take it with a, with a grain of salt. Maybe there's a little bit of exaggeration. Maybe there's a lot of exaggeration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the common themes is, is still what we're trying to get, the overarching big picture type of, not the, not the specific cases. And hopefully they don't, they don't occur. Some of these things um, may warrant serious allegations. But I would bet to say that the police department is aware of all of this. Every single case here, we can ask the same questions of them. Are you aware? What did you do about that situation if it actually did uh, occur as well. I think the same question should and can be asked on the other side as well. Okay. But but I, I understand what you're saying. But we we don't have a process where you know we go to the police department and and did this occur? Did you actually shoot and kill this person? You know that that kind of thing. Um, but there's pain. There's pain in in these stories, and that's right. that's what we're hoping to highlight. Right. Okay. Um, so now with with this the roots of um, <clears throat> shooting and violence. 
In any way, was there a comparison done to maybe any other completed surveys or community meetings with other uh, cities and towns to see kind of where we rank in, in some of the, cause, the answers that we had as a community? No, no. Okay. Um, we, we didn't. Look okay. Into that. Any plans to maybe do that or just to kind of do a comparison of, of Brockton and where we stand in, in this? Because we're not the only ones the victim of, you know, shootings and, and things like that around. So, um, yeah, so we are part of... Um, the Bigger Umbrella, the Massachusetts Communities Action Network, and there's all the affiliates, uh, like in Lynn. Uh -huh. um, so um, in Lynn, um, they're having conversations, and the, already the chief of police in Lynn already agree to some diversity training. Implicit bias. Impl implicit bias training, I'm sorry. Okay. And, um, and so, you know, uh, other citizens' towns already have passed, already trust act. And, um, and Lynn is, uh, Salem is one of them, it's about to pass one, and Lawrence already passed one, uh, Cambridge and Somerville. So this is the type of relationships that we aim aiming to build, and at Spring Springfield, they already, you know, getting into these kind of conversations because we have to understand that when we talk about cities like Brockton, the number of people in parole the number of people returning citizens and the number of people returning to, to, to incarceration are huge. Mm -hmm. And so we're putting emphasis on doing these works because, um, you know, we, we're also part of the Jobs Not Jails Coalition, but also it is important that people understand that their value as human, a whole, as a humans mm -hmm. in, in the cities like, like Brockton. So um, our sisters in Springfield, they're already starting having, having to starting these kind of conversations with the police. So um, this is what we're aiming. We're aiming to bring the community together so we can be much safer and happier living like in, in cities like Brockton. Okay. So now also to going back to the, the root causes of the shooting. So um, is there a sample that we can see of the kinds of questions that you asked to yield some of these, these answers? So um, I was the one who was doing the listening sessions in the congregations and we asked people three questions. What is the biggest concern? that you have that keep you up at night? Just a general umbrella yes, of what you're being. that was okay. the first question. The second question is, what, other is what issues would you like to see addressed in the, in the city of Brockton? Okay. And um, when we talk about shootings and the violence, what is it that you think is causing the shootings and the violence? So the five themes that came out of this is the lack of unemployment, right. lack of youth resources, yeah. homelessness, substance abuse and issues with education. So whether it is the demerit system, disciplinary demerit system, the uh, budget cuts, or restorative justice. So these kind of themes came out of, out of the umbrella of issues with education. So, um, so the five teams came out of the listen, well, that question. What do you think are the root causes for shootings and violence in Brockton? And homelessness? Homelessness. Is one of the root causes so, of shootings? Yes, I think um, homelessness because there is um, a lot of people that are afraid. So we did a listening session, Stairway to Recovery, for example, mm -hmm. and um, people said that they are afraid to walk up, to walk in the streets at any time in the, in the community, in the city, because um, they're perceived as people that are not humans as a whole walking oh. in, in the street. So this is um, some of the Stairway to Recovery members that answered those questions. And actually, some, in, some, in some congregations, people that live at the hotels. Okay, I, I think I probably should have an offline uh, communicate, um, conversation with you guys about this because I don't, I personally, I, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm trying to take them separately because they, mm -hmm. to me, they're two separate um, issues but on the same spectrum. Right. Uh, you know, and, and that's what I'm trying to look at. But I, I, I really want to see how, how what you guys got back from these people yielded some of this information that's in this report. Because I, I mean, I don't, and I'm not a police officer, but you know, when I read the stories of the shootings and things, um, it, homelessness and education don't seem to be in there. It, you know, it may have been a conflict or some other kind of situation. Oh, I mean, mm -hmm. you can ask a police officer, they're probably not at liberty to, to share that because of the sensitivity of the issue. Um, but I, I would just really like to see kind of how, how that information got to here. And I mean, there's something else too in here that you mentioned about the lack of parental, um, what was it, lack of parental, 
uh, discipline and um, all of these things, economic dignity and all of these things, and, and I, I, I don't so know. So there, there were more than, than, than five themes altogether. Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that sort of uh, were repeated over, over and over. We do have the actual questions for the police and youth survey, if you wanted to see those questions. It's, it's I don't know, maybe 12 questions or so that we can, that we can share with you. Um, I, I just want to say, and, and, and you know, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, misinterpret anything that, that you're saying, Counselor, but mm -hmm. part of me is feeling, when else does this level of scrutiny, and, and, and I, you know, with all due respect, um, when else are, are we questioning what the community is saying and what other situation? Um, we are, the way that I look at it is, is we ask the questions, we heard the community, and we are presenting what the community is saying. It almost sounds like there's lack of belief and, and there's lack of credibility in the report. And, and that's not exactly what you're saying, and I understand what you're trying to get at. But if we put all these people who are telling these stories in this room, they will absolutely be the ones who can, can communicate the realness of what they're saying. And our, it is our intention to find those who are most affected by this to have these discussions, because it only works when we have those that are affected in the room. Um, so, I'm, I, you know, part of me just feels that um, th there's, there's questioning of the validity of this, and I'm just wondering where else is that kind of uh, questioning occurring? Because this is the community speaking, and we're just presenting it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, that's how you perceive what's going on, but it kind of goes to what Council Lally said. <laughs> Your perception is your reality. I, I didn't see that at all um, in my line of questioning. My, line, my purpose is to make sure that that doesn't happen, so that these, these stories are not kind of um, just kind of thrown away or, oh, that didn't happen or that's impossible, it didn't happen. <coughs> like, that's what we need to do, and, and that's why I'm kind of asking if that happened to prevent people from coming and saying, that didn't happen, that's not true, I never heard about that. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to kind of, I guess, open up a, a, a door to be able, for you all to be able to come through it and not have to defend kind of what has been said. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe, like, like I said, I've, I've heard some of these stories, um, but, but what I got here, it, there's, there's like a disconnect, like there's something, I'm not seeing what you're saying to me here reflected in this, in that way. So, I mean, and again, like I said, I, I probably will, you know, communicate with you guys offline sure. just so that I can be a little bit more clear um, in, in how you got to this point. I, I see the pieces, but I just don't, I, I don't see them together. But, um, so I, I hope that that was clear. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. And, and again, the intention is, is, you know, what I said is not um, whether or not it's, 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 it's the case. It's, it's sort of, I understand that you're trying to get at that point. But I think we both want the same thing. We want the mm -hmm. voices of the people to be heard. That, mm -hmm. That's the point that I was trying to make in that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Farwell. No, first I'd like to say to both of you, uh, I think you've done a service by bringing information forward. We can't be everywhere as counselors, and certainly you're out in the community, and, and you get feedback as to what's going on. Uh, I have a couple of suggestions for you, and that is uh, not that meeting with the chief of police wouldn't be productive because he is the administrative head of the department, but I, I'd probably want to ask to have the shift commanders meet with you because they have more of a direct uh, line of command to the officers who go out on the street, and, and I think that's very important. Uh, my colleague, Councillor Barnes, asked some very good questions, and just to clear up if, if you feel at all uneasy about the fact that you think you're being doubted, it's just that we as human beings, forget the fact we're counselors, we're always taught to get both sides of the story. Now we're hearing your side and it isn't that we, we doubt it, but I guess we're curious and we'd love to hear the other side of the story. Um, and, and I have a favor to ask of you because I, as you know, I served in the police department for many years. The demographics of the city were different, but I enjoyed every day of it. I met a lot of interesting people, sampled foods from all around the world <laughs> because we still had a, a cross section of people. But I would hope that you would say to all of the people with whom you interact, when you encounter an officer who perhaps seems to be out of line, and, I, and I've seen it on TV, I've cringed at some of the things I've seen on TV, try to remind them that you can't judge everyone who wears a uniform by that person, hmm. just as it would be unfair for me to 
see a Cape Verdean or an African American or, or a Guatemalan or, or a Frenchman on TV committing a heinous crime and say, well, they're all like that. I mean, everyone is an individual. Are there people who don't belong on a police department? Uh, fortunately, I think we have a great police department. I serve there. But of course there are. I've seen them on ABC News. And I, I've said, how do they ever get a badge and a gun? But it's really important not to paint with that broad brush and say that because you had a bad experience, you were pulled over by an officer who seemed to be uh, out of sorts or was less than courteous, that everyone is like that. Because that, that's clearly not true. Uh, and the last thing, and then I'll yield back, uh, the Commission on Diversity. I, I really have high hopes for that group to take some of these issues that you've presented tonight and filter through them, present information right. back to us or to the, to the appropriate people. And I hope you will use that commission to get information that you feel is important into city government because we'll all watch what's going on and interact with those commission members. So I think going forward, there will be greater dialogue. I think there's more opportunity for dialogue. And on both sides of, of an issue, we've got to make sure we don't jump to conclusions about people based on what we see one person do. And I just would ask you respectfully not to have any member of the community jump to conclusions because they may have had one bad traffic stop right. or, or maybe they got arrested for, for something. And, and uh, I just would hate to see that happen. Right. Th thank you for the, for the suggestions. And in our framing, we are very, very careful to um, not have that perception that these cases are isolated um, and that not all police are. That's why I mentioned that in the, in the beginning. Um, I want to be very, very clear that this is not an attack or an intention to attack the Brockton police officers, um, but simply to give a voice to those who have these experiences and to create and foster that, that kind of dialogue. But I was very specific in mentioning that. I, I think it would have been completely biased and, and the, the whole research and, and uh, you know, survey could have been thrown out if you don't include the good and the bad that was mentioned. So there was a lot of good that was mentioned. That's why I dedicated that paragraph. And when we speak to these individuals, it is for them to share their real experiences but at the end of that, there's an ask. There's a, there's a, there's a communication attempt. There is a, 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 a solution. It's not simply pointing fingers. It's coming together and how do we fix this? That is what we're, how we're framing it to the individuals most affected when we have these communities. Because we don't want the police to, to feel attacked, but we also want the youth to be heard and then that kind of dialogue to be initiated. I, but, I, but thank I, you. I agree. I think dialogue is always important, and I, I thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Lally. Hi again. I just wanted to, uh, to sort, just sort of say that I, I did have some, some concerns about this report, but I, I, I do just want to, to state for the record that I, I do appreciate you guys going out to, you know, to gather this information, to make it a conversation. And overall, BIC really does, does really, really cares about Brockton, wants to, wants to make a difference. And I just wanted to make sure that wasn't, I just wanted to make sure that was, uh, tra that was presented in my previous questioning. So I didn't want you, you guys Tom. to be uh, leaving here full of, full of anger. I no anger in my heart whatsoever at all. Thank you. Thank Those you are all valid questions and, and concerns and things that we need to discuss anyway. Council Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I wanted to thank um, the members, um, leaders of BIC that came this evening. And the reason I filed this resolve is because, and I am the one that phrased it maybe a little deceptively, so I'll own up to that. I was at the meetings that came up with the idea of the root causes of shootings and violence because the questions were posed to us. Actually, I was at Christ Congregational Church and um, I, as it's saying, I was in the Broughton Faith Community. I am a big leader, I am a big member. And p the, the dialogue became that people were afraid to go out or they were afraid of this or afraid of that. Now, granted, there was someone almost 80 years old, there was a few people in their 60s and 70s in my group. 
and that was their, that was one of their primary fears of what would kept them awake at night. I mean, this was not the only meeting I attended. I was at Messiah, I was at um, Messiah Baptist, I'm sorry, at um, Central United Methodist. I was at a couple of different churches where this dialogues took place with different individuals, different backgrounds at different times. And that just keep, kept on arising. Now, a couple of us that were at the meeting said that we honestly never witnessed the violence. We've never been victims of it. But it was, again, as we speak, the perception for many individuals was that they were afraid because of the perceived violence in this city. And we are aware that sometimes the media is not so generous with us in, in this um, area, and they seem to highlight more so these types of episodes as, as opposed to others that um, are much more positive about our city. But as uh, we saw, and all this is accumulated, and they, they keep um, a spreadsheet, basically, of all this information, and it goes on and how to put this together. I did attend part of the Youth Summit, and the, the dialogue there at that point with the, with the students was very friendly with the police, the school police. Again, I wasn't sure of everything they said because we were, all of us were talking amongst each other. But the example is that a variety of different people live in this community. I mean, let's face it, it's over 100,000 of us. And different people experience different things at different times. And I know some of us will say that at one time in our lives we perceived something one way and we, can't we never thought that we'd see it differently. But as we you know, change or something else happens to us in our lives. What we noticed, let's face it, um, that made the news all last year unfortunately, was the terrible incidences of individuals with uh, police officers all over this nation. It's not to say the police officers are bad. It's not to say that um, all of this can't be solved, but it's just a demonstration of how anger, perception, fear, anxiety um, causes, how would I say, some negative um, feelings and negative impressions. And that's why we're hoping that this information combined with future dialogues will bring people forward and uh, turn all this around. So I wanted to thank everyone and I hope that this moves favorably to uh, City Council. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. Second. Motion made and second. On, on, on the afraid. motion, if I, if I could. On the motion, quickly. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. I, I just, I, I was a little, first of all, I, I think this is an in-depth uh, analysis, although looking at what Council Beauregard uh, put in the resolve relative to the root causes, I was confused on s some of the verbiage in there, like the need for economic dignity. I, I didn't know exa exactly what that meant. But in terms of the other community police story collection report, my thought would be, because I think this is very valuable from a community perspective, right? And it doesn't matter where you live in the city of Brock and if you're white, black, it doesn't matter. We, we all live here. But, but my, my thought would be, from a st statistic standpoint, would to try to do a broader range. So you pinpointed a hard number of ages 14 to 25. And so they're going to have their beliefs and their interactions with police on one specific level. But then if you went to, say, 30 to 40, or you get to the elders and seniors. Every group, specific group, regardless of you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, they're all gonna have their own specific viewpoints on interaction with, with law enforcement. Okay. So I would think that, although I, I, I applaud you for the efforts, I think you'd want to, to be able to really get most bang for the buck, would be to open up the, 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 the survey, I know it's 100, but, but broaden it so that when you have these face-to-face -face community dialogue meetings with all the elected officials, I would hope the mayor, I mean, the police report to the mayor, we would be able to say, okay, for this specific group, you know, the, the, the uh, middle, middle uh, junior high, high school group, college group is this. But, but I, I really think the, the, the injustice would be not to broaden, broaden it from a, from a standpoint because you're going to get more on that analysis when you, when you open it up. So I, I would deem this as, as phase and step one, and I think this, you should be applauded for this. But, but I think being a, a counselor at large for 11 years, I, I would like to see it, and I'll, I'll work with you. I have worked with Vic, but I think for, for elected officials, we need to see it because right now, it's, it's, it's one specific group, and again, some of it's hearsay, some of it's probably fact, but I, I, I think to, to be able to reach the goal, and all our goal would be the same, would be able to say, 
okay, when we sit down with the elected officials and we sit down with the police and we sit down with superintendent of schools and, and what my colleague said, the shift commanders, I, I think the, the real value would be to say, okay, this is, this is in its entirety. That's just my humble suggestion. When I read it, I said, okay, this is eye-opening and this is, this is a good step one, but, but I would want to know what other people's viewpoints are. You know, I, I think that that would have a lot of value. Thanks. That's Thank just my humble suggestion. opinion. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank I, think, you. I think we did that specifically re real quick. Um, uh, if you look at those who are being arrested, those that are committing the crimes, it's mostly the youth. And so we I wanted have, to sort of. I have a motion on the floor. Motion made and second and recommend favorably full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommend it favorably. Thank you very much for, for the information and your report. Yeah, Item number four. Resolved that the mayor or his designee, the collector treasurer and the city solicitor or his designee to be invited to appear before a committee of the city council to update council members on the status of the Whitman dispute in efforts to obtain payment. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Martin Brophy, collector treasurer, Philip C. Nazarella and or his designee solicitor, Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner. Mr. Chairman. Council Farwell. Mr. Chairman, I spoke with the solicitor this morning. This matter is still under active litigation and negotiation, and I would move to table this to a FinCom meeting in July Second. or at Second. the call of Actually, the chair. Actually, you'd want to rephrase that to uh, postpone. To postpone, I'm sorry, yes. Fincom. Move to so postpone to a finance committee meeting in July. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to postpone to the finance committee meeting in July, which will be only one because we will be on summer schedule. All those in favor? Opposed? Postponed to July, FinCom. Uh, by the way, uh, Council, uh, Mr. Brophy sent me a letter that he's on vacation this week, uh, so he couldn't be here anyways. Item number five. Resolved that the city's mayor and solicitor come before the finance committee to provide a status update and to discuss reacquiring the real property located at 226 Main Street, commonly known as the Gainley Building, that was conveyed by the city for nominal consideration to the Commonwealth for purposes of using the property as a college collaborative, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, and Philip Nazarella, City Mr. Solicitor. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, as you know, this is my resolve along with my colleague from Ward 3. Um, I, I think I, I want to thank the City Solicitor for being here, but I think it would, uh, it would really give us a lot of value if the Mayor himself was here as well. Um, so I am going to make a motion to postpone this. Um, and due to the fact that the Chair uh, and President of the Council is going to be calling budget June 6th, 7th, 8th, I'd like to postpone this to the FinCom uh, in June after the budget. Second. Motion made and seconded to postpone to the FinCom meeting on June, I believe it's 13, to the FinCom meeting at, in June. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number six. Resolve that the record owner of 121 Main Street, the mayor, superintendent of buildings, city solicitor, a representative of the 21st Century Corp, and Gary Leonard be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the demolition of the building and the cost to the city, recouping the cost and plans for the redevelopment of the property. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Philip Nazarella, solicitor, Bruce Jackson, Brockton Main Street Improvement, LLC, David Edelman, Brockton Main Street Improvement, LLC, John Marion, Chairperson, Brockton 21st Century Corp, Michael Gallerini, Executive Director, Brockton 21st Century Corp, and Gary Leonard, Main Street Manager, Brockton 21st Century Corp. Councilor Byrnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nazarella, for coming. And the, the owners are not here, um, as we can see. But I, I wanted to ask you, have you had any communication with them? Do they exist? Are these <coughs> real people? No, no, I have not. Um, Mr. Okay. Kassiri is here. I don't know. He would have been in direct contact with them. Um, but I, I've never had contact with them. Yet. Oh, okay. Mr. Yeah, Kassiri he, is not, uh, not on the invited list with the, if there's no objections. If Mr. Kassiri could step forward. Please. I, I can tell you that I'm doubtful if there was a lot of communication with them because I learned earlier today when checking with the treasurer's office that a, um, a foreclosure deed has been issued which has foreclosed out their rights of redemption. Uh, so the city uh, effectively owns the property at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that occurred uh, May 3rd, just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, so I, I guess prior to that, you know, and I guess in between the report um, that was drafted for the safety of the building that, that was presented right after it was torn down and today, have you had any? What, I have not, been? no. So we technically don't know if these people even exist. Well, there's a, they're an LLC. Now, we had, 
I had conversations with them a year ago when we first discovered that there were problems with the building and we put the staging around the building. In person conversation or on the phone? Personal conversation. Okay, so um, people. That they had intended to move forward with the project and they were in the process of getting their funding, but their funding wasn't in place, so at that point the city had to go ahead and, and remove the facade. Now, as far as conversations with them personally since then, I have not had any. Okay, is there a way to track that, to track who uh, requests funding? Like, I, I mean, I don't want this to, I mean, it probably won't be like an Aquaria kind of situation, but I don't want this to be, to turn into something like that, like these phantom owners that we request and request to come and they snub their nose. I mean, I just, I just want to ask a few questions about what's going on. Actually, you know what, no. Um, now that we own it back We're the then, owners now. Yeah, they're actually not even necessary. Huh, excellent. Um, oh, can, I, can I withdraw this or? Uh, we would just make a motion to recommend favorably. If nobody else has any questions. Second. Just, 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 just a comment. Councilor Ian If I might, because it goes back to just about what I was saying a few weeks ago when the mayor stood in front of us. So here we are now with supposedly the fourth person which supposedly owned the property and we did one greatest thing for them we took it down and now we own the corner correct i mean the lean part that's all well, get my get my head straight on it because it sounds like everything changed within the last few weeks when when they were first or when the mayor was first here and we were discussing discussing excuse me that issue mm -hmm. pertaining to the building coming down so um, he said that, you know, within the year, it'd be a year, within a year before we probably would know if it was ours or not. But now all of a sudden, it's ours. The person had the baby early. As far as the decisions that were made to do what the city had to do, there was really, our hands were tied on those because of the public safety issues. So the building had to come down regardless. And right. we had no choice but so, to do what we did. Uh, okay, so my head. But so if I for anyone to come forward and propose a new project i'm not sure where that is where that leaves us so that's a, that's something that we'll have to ask the mayor just well he's gonna have to at some point um however we'll have to file a but the building all of the all of the uh bills have been sent out and all the liens are in place so for somebody to approach that purchase that property that's when we will get our money back okay okay so but at this point it, it's ours okay thank you thank you mr chairman on the, on the motion, if I could. We don't have a motion yet. So. Oh, okay. Uh, through you to, the, to uh, Councilor Barnes. Councilor, yes, I'd sir. respectfully ask that you uh, postpone this matter due to the fact that I, I, I too, echo the sentiments of Councilor Ian Airy. Um, the city would have known, foreclosure doesn't happen overnight, the city would have known when they came before us that it was going to happen right. fairly soon. So I'd like to hear from the mayor himself on that. If a deed has already been issued, that takes time and serving and everything else. So, um, okay, I would, so there's no motion, and is that right? Not yet. Motion, motion. Okay, Any so other questions? I'd like to move to postpone um, this matter to the July um, FinCom meeting. Just second. 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 Motion made and seconded to postpone to the July FinCom meeting. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. a moment of personal privilege. Councilor Razak. Um, I would just like to thank um, and congratulate, actually, all the Bright, uh, Brockton High School Drama Department and um, the cast and crew of this past weekend's musical, Footloose. They did an amazing job, and um, they make us proud. All uh, Brockton students made us proud. So um, just want to thank them for a job well done. It was a great show. Thank you. Councilor Lally. Uh, just a moment of personal privilege. You may. I would like to wish my uh, my youngest sister Grace a happy birthday today. All right. Happy birthday, Grace. Do we know how old? No comment. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no Council comment. Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, a moment of personal privilege here. A uh, lot goes on in uh, Ward 5, and uh, two big things going on next week is the Route 28 Corridor Public Workshop Study here is going to be taking place next Tuesday, uh, beginning at 5.30 p.m., 
at the Broughton Public Library, 304 Main Street. And this is the whole discussion of the plans of uh, Route 28 being Montello and Main Street in some places, going from Avon to the Westbridge water line and uh, people's inputs, the current uh, existing uh, conditions, traffic issues and safety, and the plans for potential improvements. And I'd also like to make announcement that I'm having my uh, second Ward 5 uh, city meeting here on uh, Wednesday, March 25th from 6.30, 8.30 at Caffrey Towers and would love it if uh, people could attend. And you don't have to live in Ward 5 to come. I'll have several uh, speakers on uh, in different departments in the city to um, inform uh, the residents. Thank you. Could you give me that date again? March. Oh, I'm sorry. March, May 25th. I'm sorry. Council <laughs> <laughs> like Sullivan. The Chairman, more than personal privilege. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, myself, uh, Council Rodriguez, Council Barnes, Council Farwell, the four at largest, we're hosting our second um, citywide meeting. It's this Thursday night. It's the 19th of May. It's 615 to 815. It's at South Middle School in the cafeteria. And we really would, would uh, encourage anybody and everybody to please show up. It's going to be really an important meeting. So again, 615 this Thursday night in the CAF at South Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? We're adjourned.